Well, praise God. I'm excited to be with you guys. Thank you for the invitation. Pastor Eugene, it's, for me it's an honor to be here and share the word with you guys. About five years ago, we did uh, one of the services on Wednesday. At that time, uh, our church was heavily involved in homeless ministry. Not only the homeless people came to the church service, but a lot of people came because it was a very incredible time we had. A lot of people from the streets, the church people, we had food, we had prayer, we had worship. Everything was fine. We had a lot of guests, and sometimes I even counted a lot of people, more than on Sundays. I remember after the service, I was so satisfied. I came home. I was like, wow, the service was really great. The church was really good. I felt satisfied. And, you know, I look at the Facebook, try to see the pictures, and suddenly I found the review from somebody who visited our church. And you know, we, we live in a life where everybody try to post some reviews at the restaurant, the movie, right, where we just watch, the church we attended, right? And people are kind of like, they, 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 they wanted to share what they experienced. And I remember that review, it was like one star, somebody, and it was the long, 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 long complaint. I was like, oh my God. I cannot erase that, right? So it's right there. It's uh, immediately uh, downward everything what we had. And the lady, she's like, ah, oh, everything was great. Till somebody start saying to her, praying over her, prophesying, directing her. And she's like, oh, my God, this church, I, I tried to run from this guy, and he was pursuing me. This is crazy church. People don't go to this church because if you're going to come, they're going to do it to you. And I was like, trying to re remember. I tried to even engage the conversation with her. And uh, what was to the end, you know, it was a guest who visited our church. Not from our church, somewhere else. And after the church service, he tried to communicate with her, tried to pray for her. And whatever was happening in between, it's happened. And I tried to explain, it's, he's not from our church. But he still prayed for me, who allowed him to lay hands on me, who allowed him to prophesy. I had no clue about. And I tried to apologize. I tried to like, okay, next time we're going to be much better watching who is praying. But it's, it's hard to control, right? So I think it's still there, that uh, negative review for our church on one of the Facebook. Uh, I still remember that. What makes a church great? That's a good question, right? I remember a lot of people, they ask in this question, you know, and they try to discover a perfect church. They want to find a perfect church where they feel great. For example, for this lady, that church wasn't great anymore. It's a terrible church because somebody done something stupid. And we know we're not a perfect church, right? Maybe you're a perfect church. Our church is not a perfect church. And I know some people, they're looking for a good church, a great church, and, and they're looking around. And I remember uh, uh, one family, they attended our church, and suddenly they stopped. And, uh, and I, was, I, 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 um, I saw them at the mall, and I was like, why you don't come anymore to our church? And they said, well, we found a great church. Hey, it's so hard to hear that, right? Great church? Okay, so that means our church is not that great like their church, right? I was like, okay, good, all right. That, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you found the great church. Man, this is a great church. We're really excited. I was like, what is, what is the greatness? What, can you explain? Can you give, give me like maybe some, uh, you know, so I can, I can maybe implement something in our church? Man, they have a great Sunday school. We just drop our child there and we don't have to worry. It's a great church. Well, I cannot compete with that, right? We don't have this Sunday school like they have. So according to their definition of the great church, my church is not that great. Because I don't have a Sunday school system like they have. Right? I remember another one. After, you know, the homeless ministry, as we did, you know, we provide meal for 
Uh, it was the favorite soup uh, uh, that one family always uh, uh, made for us. Uh, Zupa Tuscane was like a favorite. The people, they, they, they came not for the church, not for the worship service, just to eat the soup. And they're like, I love this church. This is the great church. But what is the best? The soup. Mm. So for them, the great church, because we serve the soup. It mean, as soon as we stop serving the soup, guess what? It's not a great church anymore, right? They, they like, you know, I, I like the old days. Free meal, good soup, and now we don't serve well because the things change. But the church doesn't become great because we serve soup or not serving soup, right? So for me, it's like it's always like then I read the word of God. I try the Lord, we want to be a great church. We want to find our place under heaven and, and, and be a great church. We cannot compete with other churches, right? Because sometimes, you know, like the modern expectation of the church, you know, you have to have a great worship team. It's like, boom, it's like the stars. They have to be like very best, you know. Make sure they have CDs and make sure they like going to the tours and then they, they famous. So this is, if, if, if you have that, it's a great church. You can attract a lot of young people. You have to have a media team. You know, they need to have all of these uh, websites, all, all of these apps, blogs. Uh, I mean, everything what they have, everything what you said. It's, it's a group of uh, people, they're working hard. And it's like, even if I miss the church service, they have everything. I can watch from home. I can invite. It's like a movie theater, you know. Everything set, like five cameras. Oh, they all move, and it's like, it's great. You have to have that. Sunday school, of course. Everything must be in place. Everything's supposed to be running so great. You just, you, you, you don't have to have any kids in the room. They're all taken care of. They have the Sunday school. They have the Sunday school church. They're already there. There is a group of people. They're working. I mean, I love to do that. But sometimes, is that how we define a great church? What is the definition for us? Uh, I want to have a great church. I want to have a great church where I can come and experience God's presence. You know, uh, for some people it's going to be different. Maybe you're looking for the Sunday school, you will find somewhere. If you're looking for something else, for a great, famous preacher, you may find something. But what I found, because for me it's not... Uh, it, I want to look into the Bible and see what the Bible teaches us about the, how the church is uh, supposed to look like. For me, you know, it's a lot of books, uh, how to become a great church. It's several bullets, how to become an attractive church. Or I remember I read not far, uh, 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 not long ago, uh, the, the book called uh, Liquid Church. And they, they called themselves Liquid Church. And they said, uh, we, we like, we everywhere. And they do it, it, it's so many things. And it's like, I read that book. And it's like, are we going to share with you? If you implement what we're doing, you will have a great church like we are. And I read that. I was like, man, I don't have so much liquid like they have to be that church. You know, that liquid, that, and then they, they have water everywhere. They, they cover in everything in New Jersey. And then and, and the, the church is great. And the two years of, of that church, that church like booming like crazy. And, and now because of the seven years of, uh, of existence of that church, that church is listed one of the, the fastest growing church in America. I was like, you read it's like, my God, I'm so far, so far from them. And that's why I love come back to the scriptures, right? Because the scripture can define what is the great church all about. Think about the early church, the first church, which was born on the day of the Pentecost, remember? Do you know anything about the worship team they had? Did they ever have the worship team? They didn't have even the building, right? They kind of borrowed the sanctuary. They came, it was a lot of rituals. They didn't have a Sunday school, <laughs> right? There was no Sunday school at the early church. And definitely there was no projections, no video or audio. But we know as an early church, it was a great church because it was the beginning. Not perfect church. It's not necessarily a great church as a perfect church. 
No. There's a lot of challenges. As you read throughout the scripture, as you read from the chapter 2 and 3, you will find a lot of mistakes that church did. But because Jesus Christ was present, because they had been obedient to God's word, and something was moving among them, the Holy Spirit and that church become great. Hallelujah. Not long ago, I went to the mall and I bought the hat, the red hat. You know what the red hat I associate with, right? And he said, what you want to put it over there? And I said, okay, let me help you. And I told him, make the church great again. And the guy, he was, uh, I was like, are you sure you want to wear that hat? I have it. I tried to find it. I don't know what I, what I did to that hat, but I have it. Because I think this is the season we need to bring some greatness into our church. Especially because it's not a building. It's not somewhere. It, we are the church, right? And we need to look with the biblical perspective. I remember I, I, I made this hat and uh, uh, immediately I, I, I started wearing it in the mall. You know, and people are like, you know, like in Northwest, it's very dangerous. Very dangerous. And people are like, you know, they're watching me what I'm wearing. I mean, how, how, how dare I can wear this in the mall? But as soon as they start reading, they smile. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course, of course. I visited uh, our neighbor church, uh, uh, African-American church, and I wear that hat. You need to see the expression of the people. Because the first thing what they see, right, is a familiar hat. And they're like, how the pastor of our neighbor church he entered the building in the hat and plus with that logo. And I was like, hey, you have to read it. And they're like, oh, okay, okay, welcome, welcome. <laughs> yes, we need to make the church great again. How to do that and what we need to do. And I think that's why we need to come back to the scriptures because I believe the scripture is perfect defining what the church is all about. Amen. So the first thing, as we're going to read, if you're familiar with the, uh, the Acts, because I think the Acts is like a foundation for the great church. You can read, you can study. There's a lot of books written about the Acts 2, 3, chapter 5, 6, and you will find a basic foundation how the church is supposed to be. And that's why I love to come back to chapter 2, 3, and 4, and 5. Well, the first thing I believe, you know, what to make church great it's a testimony from outsiders. They will say, well, the church is kind of like for us. Uh, uh, who cares what kind of reviews they're going to write, what they experience or not experience. I remember one of the things, what I remember, one of the church celebrated 20 or 25 years. And, and, and it was great. And one of the speakers came and was like, uh, that's good. Uh, I congratulate the, uh, the church. Uh, you made it all the way here, all throughout the years. But let me ask you a question. What if, instead of celebrating anniversary, what if you will shut down your church completely? You decided we're not going to do the church anymore. Okay. If anyone from outsiders will notice that, what well, there is no church anymore, Wow, right? And this is really depends what kind of connection we have with outsiders. If the church serves the purpose of God, definitely the neighbors, they will notice there is the church on that street, right? It's not just the building. It's the people who are devoted to God, and they make the, 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 uh, the presence of God evident for all neighborhoods. Look, the first church, the early church, 247 Acts, praising God and having goodwill or favor of all the people. You know how hard it was for them to do that? It's a new movement. But for some reason, the outsiders, they felt something different. If you carefully read the scripture, you will find, and the Peter was speaking, and it, it, the, the old church, they gathered together. They, they felt something different. They realized, they recognized that Peter was with Jesus. It was something different than they just came to the, to the gathering and do the, all the rituals. Something was different. And that's why all people, they felt like, man, that's good people. You know, um, 
our church attracted many people. <laughs> and, uh, and some of them, they was like, you have a good family. And your church, they have a good family. And I remember uh, several people, they came because they want to find somebody to build a good family, right? And it's like, wow, I love Ukrainians because you guys, you all about the family. I said, yes, but it's not because all Ukrainian about the family, right? It's because we believers. And I try to tell him, hey, I need, to, I need to find someone Ukrainian who will be like you guys. So he went several times to Ukraine, tried to find someone in Ukraine. And I told him, it's very dangerous. We don't have a lot of believers in Ukraine. You will find even worse people than you will have in America because Ukraine is in, in, in one of the uh, five countries, uh, divorce, abortion, and, and, and all other stuff, what, what, what they have. So I said, you're not going to find, because we represent a, a little bit because we are believers. So after a couple times, he tried to engage with some kind of relationship. He said, ah, I don't know. I don't want to marry at all. Why? Because his expectation was failed. Then the outsiders come into our church. I believe, and this is what they're looking for because we bring in that favor of God. And, and they want it. They want to hire someone, right? A friend of mine, he said, hey, I have an apartment. Can you find someone from your church so I can rent it? I said, why you want from our church to rent your apartment? I said, you know what? I, I, I know believers, they're not going to lie. And I was like, I hope so too. <laughs> because we know. We know a lot of people, right? But this is their expectation. Verse 13, chapter 5, it says, No one rests there to join them, but the people held them in high esteem or spoke well of them. I don't know how they, how they did this. Do you think uh, immediately at that one service, everybody become perfect? They joined the church service and every No. But there is something was from, for outsiders. They noticed something. It was different. They didn't claim to be perfect. They're all sinners, right? Saved by the grace of God. And they become a community where they can look forward. They can want to spend some time. I don't know if you have a friend or not. I mean, I have friends, I'm believers, and they want to spend time with me. Not because I'm perfect, but because he trusts me with things, with his family. I'm not dragging him to church. But I want to spend time with him. I want to pray with him. And he sometimes shares things with me, but he never shares with anybody else. Why? Because they see something. What to make church great? Your relationship with God. And even outsiders. That's why even if you try or attempt to uh, ordain someone in church, do you know there is the Bible says? He must have a good reputation from outsiders, right? Pretty much, you can ask the family members how good he is. Oh, he's good. Of course, we know we need him to promote him because he needs to be ordained. But hold on a second. Can you go and ask the neighbor what he's thinking about your fellowship with God? Amen? And I know some of them, they can create a lot of rumors about you, but... You always find a good testimony because something God is doing in our lives. Amen? The second thing is a testimony within the church. Something happened in the church. It's not a club, right? It's not something what we came together to entertain together. Something is happening within the church. There is the fire of God. There is the source of God's life. And everyone who come into that fellowship, they experience that. And that's how the Bible described, how came upon everyone. Not how Peter preached. Not, not because they shake the Peter's hand. Oh, Peter is the famous. No, because they experience God. And because they experience God, for them, it was not just another gathering. It was the encounter with God Almighty. I mean, what was the last time you encountered God? 
during the worship service. Then God speak, spoke to you directly and changed your perspective and changed your life. Because this is important for us to experience God. And the great fear sees the whole church. This is a testimony from inside the church. You know, we, we don't want to talk about that. But I think every time that you meet God, every time that you experience the God's grace, something is going to happen in your, in my life. The fear of God, which is the beginning of the, God's wisdom, is going to come into your heart. And you will be different because you just met God. With the great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And the great grace was upon them all. Hallelujah. You know, sometimes the word is grace. How we can experience grace. You know, in our church, City of Rain Church, we have a motto. A place of grace for all nations. And sometimes we have to remind people because... You know, we love the word grace, but as if it's only considered us, right? When it comes to our other people, we want like, no, no, not grace. We need to discipline them. We need to make sure they change. We need to make sure they don't suffer. And as a result, if they change, we will give them grace. You know how many churches? They measure of God's grace, even though it's impossible to do that. But they want to keep the control of God's grace, Right? Who's supposed to come? Who's supposed to repent? How, how are they supposed to worship? How are they supposed to respond to God's call? But the grace of God is undeserved mercy. And it comes and sometimes comes to the people. And you will be surprised how the God's grace working. Sometimes it was like, Lord, can you do not touch them? Because they need to go through this grieving, you know, uh, make sure God, uh, that the conscience is still kind of, uh, you know, telling them what they want and that they need to experience this feeling, you know. But you see some people, they come and they experience the God's grace because it's by the God's power. And every day in the temple and at home, they did not cease to teach and proclaim Jesus as the Messiah. So what is inside? Why we experience grace? Why we experience God? Because there is the teaching about God's word. It is about gospel. We cannot become a social club. Because sometimes that's what we do. We try to entertain people. But our goal is to bring them closer and closer to the gospel. Because only because of the gospel. Because of the gospel. People are transformed and changed. We could, could not change the environment around us if we don't preach gospel. We cannot just hand them a book or the booklet and say, if you do this, if you read my testimony, and you will be fine. No, we need to introduce them to the gospel. And this is the work, what God is expecting for us to do, to preach the gospel. So what's to make the church great? You know, there is the marks of, uh, of great church. Accordingly to what we just read, and there is the three marks what I believe. I know there's going to be more. Sometimes, you know, uh, you know, sometimes churches, they like that. We are focused on worship, for example. If you want to go and, and experience God in prayer, you need to visit that church. We not specialize in prayer. We aren't specializing in worship. And I'm like, okay, if I need the prayer, I need to go to this church. If I need to study the word of God, I need to go to the Baptist because that's the only one they do. They study and study and memorize and study and memorize and study. But if I need to worship, go to charismatic church because they, instead of, they, their sermon is very short, 15, 20 minutes, but the rest of the time they just worship. And it's like, this is our specialty. That's what we do. But I believe the church is supposed to combine all of this and I think it's important for us to understand. Because what makes the church great, then we all learn how to worship God. We all learn how to read the word. We all learn how to pray. But the first mark of the great church 
The first mark in making a great church is the converted membership. Well, don't, don't scare the word membership because some, for some people, like, we don't believe in membership. Well, we are a member. If you've born, been born from above, you are a member of God's family. You know, it's, it's necessity today to preach what the people, they must be born again. You know that? If for some reason, we, we allowed people, because they've been born in a Christian family, to, to fill the churches. And, and sometimes we want to make a great church, right? But how are you going to make a great church then the people, they're not converted to God? I remember one person, he came, and he's like, you know what? I have a struggle in my family. There is so many problems in my family, my, with my wife, with my kids. And I've been a Christian for many, many years. And you know what? I, I visited that church. That bishop prayed for me, but nothing helped. I also asked that prophet to prophesy and pray for me. Nothing helped. Maybe you can change me. I said, let it try. So I took him to the office. And the first question I asked him, are you born again? And he's like, yeah, I told you. I become a member of the church. Then I was 17. I was baptized at that time. I said, no, no, no. Are you born again? And he, he's like, what do you mean? I read the Bible. Sometimes I go to church. I, I, I even was involved in the usher ministry. I was like, no. Are you being born again? And he's like Nicodemus, you know. I was like, what? What are you talking about? Have you ever asked the Lord to forgive your sins, to save you? He's like, okay, I remember. And he's telling me the story. Once he was driving in his car, and he felt that it was the very high speed, you know, and then he felt like his will is about to fall apart from his car. And he said, in that moment, I knew if God will not save me, I will crush and die. And I asked this prayer, Lord, save me. And suddenly, car stopped, and I changed the tire. I said, so? God saved me. I asked and God saved me. I was like, well, that's good what God saved you. But it's not the same thing what I'm asking you. Are you being born again? And he's like, finally, was like, tell me exactly what you want to know. I said, have you ever asked God to forgive you your sins? He said, you know what? I'm much better than many members of my church are much better. And I was like, okay, I will see you next time. The conversation is done. You need to be born again. I'm not going to spend time with you anymore. You have to go and ask the Lord to convert you, right? Because it's not something I do. It's not something what I place the words in his mouth. You know, in our membership class, that's what we do. There is the class that's necessity of the new birth. And, and I told, and I always tell them, you know what? I'm not going to place the words what I want to hear from you. You have to talk to me because I'm going to pray and ask the Lord and God will reveal if you've been born again. And there's some questions and you have to kind of prove it to me somehow through the different questions, through that lesson that God touched your life. That's why we, before they accept anyone into the membership, we ask them to write their testimony, how God actually touched them, if they remember or not. And for some people, it's very difficult. Very difficult, because we live in an environment where we completely corrupted the idea to be born again, right? One family, she came, uh, and, and, and it's like, we want to be become a member of your church. Like, what, 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 okay, there's application. And there's the question, have you been born again? And they're like, okay, the first time I was born again, then I was 7, 11, 17, 41. And it was like so many times, again and again and again and again. I was like, okay, we need to talk. How this happened? You keep born in again. And, I mean, what's wrong? What's wrong? And I said, you know, the first time that I was born again, I was seven years old. They baptized me. The next time it was at the youth camp, it was altar call. And after that, I messed up. I ended up in jail. And one preacher came to jail, and I was born again, again. On and on and on and on. And I, I, I told him, maybe you've never been born again. Maybe this is the reality, right? And somebody needs to tell you, 
But he said, no, but I, I, I repeat the sinner's prayer. I did it from my heart. And the pastor and the preacher said, now you're born again. Ask him. Something must be inside of us, right? And that's why the story, what we read after the preaching of Apostle Peter, at his first sermon he delivered, you know, he didn't make the altar call, but something happened, right? Something happened, and some people, they're like, brothers, what we're supposed to do, right? Tell us what we're supposed to do. Brothers, what we should we do? And Peter, he was bold. He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we know that what's happened. We need to continue to preach that, and especially to the generations, and especially among us, Slavic people. For some reason, uh, many young people. You know, I was, I was in my... Uh, uh, I was, I was still young, but I was already uh, in the board me meeting, elders of the church. And I remember it was a very interesting conversation. It's like, well, we need to baptize someone. And uh, there is, you, you have to have an interview through the el uh, elders meeting. And then it's like, who, who is agree? Who is, who is uh, raise your hand? And I was like, I don't know him. I never see him in the church. And I remember one deacon stood and he said, but... Um, they have a wedding in six months, so we need to do it fast. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. What do you mean, wedding? He's not born again. Well, yes, but maybe this Sunday, if you say the sermon and call for the altar call, he will come, he will say whatever you want. <laughs> Invitation already been delivered. We cannot, the, the, the place already been ordered. The people are already invited. We cannot ruin the wedding. I was like, what? What are you talking about? Let him to be born again. Or he can do the wedding, but without our participating us. as claiming he is a believer, right? You know what kind of drama it was? How many people, they came to me and said, man, we will wait till your daughter is going to be the same situation. I said, you know what? I'm going to be the one who will say no. I need to make sure if someone is born again. But how many people they just entered? And guess what? He, he, yeah, he's, he's kind of a member. Attends once a month. You know, he's always busy. You know, his family is not really devoted to God. And we, we made this generation, and definitely how we can make the church great if we have so many people, they claim they are born again, but they've never been touched by God. And, and even worse to that, because we gave them the false assurance or document you're a church member, you don't need to worry about. And they struggle in their souls. They don't have this desire to serve God. They don't have this love toward God. But because we did this, because we allowed them, and they struggle. And the people outside the church, they struggle as well. Amen? Amen. The second mark in the making of the great church is a constant ministry. And if you read the, the, the early church, it was not the church of one day. Only on Sunday. I'm busy for church. I will do everything. But on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, this is my business. This is what I like to do. And it's nothing to do with the church. But look, the early church, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread and prayers day by day. Hallelujah. Devoted themselves as they spent much time together in the temple. They broke bread at home, ate their food with the glad and generous hearts, praising God. No wonder they be in a great church. Because everyone wants to meet God. Everyone wants to participate. There's the elements of to be a great church. You know, the, the, the word, they devoted themselves. There's a, one of the definitions I found. The holy devotion, a sacred time. Sacred time refers to a time set apart by God, often for religious observations that honor God's goodness and his past acts of the deliverance. If we're not born again, it's not interesting for us. 
we're going to be devoted for something else. Because devotion, it's a commitment to something. That's where your heart is. And that's why it's very hard to ask someone, if he is not born again, to be devoted to something. Because for him, it's going to be too much. Too much church, too much reading, too much praying. Because they're not there yet. But for the believers who love God, it's always not enough, right? They come earlier to church for fellowship. And they're probably going to live the last. You have to kick him out of the church because it's not enough for them. Because they want to spend some time with God, with the fellowship. And if you break down here, devotion to God, the first thing, devoted the sacred time to study of God's word. Listen, we have epidemic problem in the United States. You know, for me personally, I love the bookstore. I don't know. I mean, not just the general bookstore. I love the Christian bookstore. I can spend hours there. You may call me crazy. I may not buy any book, but I'm going to sit there and read and read a little bit there, a little bit there. I love, I love. But then I found the last Christian bookstore was closed in Taquila, the Lifeway. And it was not just that store because they kind of like okay we're gonna they used to have like five seven stores in washington and they they kept closing kept closing and it's like finally they made this one big one and they brought all the books one big one and talk will was like oh fine it's next to my house i don't need to drive anywhere i love it and finally they shut down that store because they said people they don't buy books anymore everything online I don't know if they buy buying online. I don't, I'm not sure the Christians like, oh, we don't need books. We're going to buy online. We're going to read online. I remember one friend of mine, he bought that note, Samsung 10. And I was like, why do you need this? I'm going to read books. And after a year or so, I asked him, so how many books have you read and, and in your device? And he said, well, almost one. Because I know it's hard to read. Maybe if you have a bigger device, you can. But it's still, I love the presence of the real book. And there's the epidemic because we stop studying the word of God. Then we introduce in our, in our church, uh, you know, Monday to Friday, read together, pray just a chapter a day. You know how many people is like, we don't have time. But it's only 15 to 20 minutes a day. Can you devote yourself to the study of word of God, just the 20 minutes of your time. Can you ever check how many times? I mean, we have a great devices right now. iPhone introduced. Now they will tell you every week how many times you've been on the phone, right? The, the screen time, Facebook, hours. And I was like, I was like first I was like, wow, this is crazy. How many times we spend? Can we have a 20 minutes, at least a 20 minutes a day to study? The God's word. Can we devote ourselves? We want, we want God, but for some reason we want him, but we don't want his word. I think it's completely different. The second thing, devotion to the fellowship. What is the fellowship? It's, it's, it's a life together. It's a life together. You know, we, we live in the individual, uh, individualistic world. Then people, they don't associate with each other. They don't want to uh, have new friends. They have like five, seven families around them. They don't want to break anything. They, they're like, you know what? I, I'm not really good to have a fellowship with someone I don't know. But if you've been born again, and if you're reading the Word, the next thing, what is going to come to your heart, right? I want to have fellowship with someone. I want to spend some time with the believer. And that's what they did from the beginning. It was not enough for them just to meet them once on Sunday. They want to dedicate themselves to meet daily. I'm not asking you to do that. But that, can we start with something, right? We can increase time. Sometimes if you've never been in the fellowship, you don't know it's awkward, you know. You don't know what to say. How are you? What is the weather? You know, but if you don't have anything common, it's very awkward for some people to have the fellowship. But I want to encourage people to have fellowship. Devotion is sacred time to the breaking of bread. I will give you one example. Once I visited one church in Tacoma. It's a Korean church. And uh, I was invited for the, the pastor's fellowship. 
and I didn't expect it to see that or uh, more to say to smell this. Because as soon as I entered the, the, the sanctuary, I mean the, the, the church, I felt I entered into the restaurant. You know, the Korean food restaurant. It smells so terrible. I mean, for me. I mean, for them, maybe it's like good. I was like, what's happening? So they have a sanctuary, but next to the sanctuary, they have a huge hallway, huge kitchen. I think a better kitchen than anybody else have in the restaurant. So there, in, in, in the hallway, they have tables, like, you know, like, like Slavic tables, like tables, uh, those, uh, 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 not the chairs, but the branches, then they sit, and it's like for three, four hundred people. And I was like, why is so, and they said, every time, after the worship, we cook and we eat. This is our tradition. Why? Because this is what Jesus did. He preached from the table, before the table, after food, before food, in the middle of the... So it was always around that. And that's why we love to have this fellowship. Because you know what's happening Then we eat each other? Because something is happening. You break the barrier of relationship. And you're accepting someone who, I don't know what kind of social status, what he done, but if you're eating with someone, it's something different is happening, especially with the person who you never met before, right? Prayer is important. You know that. But for some reason, for Christians, it's the last thing, what we do, right? If something happened in your family, you got sick, or your family member is going through the emergency room, you will attend the prayer meeting. Brothers and sisters, please pray for me because our family is in the need. Okay, we will pray for you. But what about then? Everything is fine. You have no time for the prayer. You're not devoted to the prayer. You have no interest in the prayer. You got bored in the prayer. You know, in our church, then we went through the Bible study and we talked about the prayer. We, 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 we taught them uh, the prayer, what is called seven Seven up prayer. You, you ever heard the seven up prayer? The challenge, seven up prayer. Have you ever heard about that? There's a challenge. You can try that and you will see if you're going to make it to the end. For the seven days, get up at the 7 a.m. and pray seven minutes. For the seven days, you get up at 7 o'clock and pray for seven minutes. You'll say, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm, no, I'm not early. If you get up at 11, Pray for 11 days, 11 minutes. <laughs> but we need prayers, amen? And the last thing, and I will finish, the Lord Margaret making a great church that continual multiplication. You know, church is not for only for us. I'm saved, I'm good, I'm fine. Uh, that's, that's the only thing where I'm, uh, where I'm fine with this. But, you know, we have a mission. And there's the mission of God for everyone in the church. Go and make disciples of all nations, amen? So it's not, a, it's, it's not a only the, the mission for the pastors, for the ministers, for the leaders. Everyone's supposed to be involved in that mission. You know, we need to explain for people why we're here, why we have church. Because some of them, oh, are we waiting for the Lord? And we're waiting for the Lord. He's supposed to come any, any minute, any second, and we don't want to be distracted. You're not going to be distracted if you're going to be in the field of God, preaching and sharing the gospel of God, and making, this, uh, making the difference in somebody else's life. Because this is our mission. We multiply, we replicate the things what God does for us. In my prayer, you know, I know there's a lot of things what I need to learn every day and remind myself about that. But I believe God wants us to be a great church, amen? amen. Not because we, uh, because we read the book of the, the, the great uh, Saddleback Church in, in California, Rick Warren, and he made this. You know, how do you have to run the church. There's examples, how you're supposed to do. But because we read the word of God and there is the essential principles for all of us. And I believe the outsiders, even insiders, they will share the testimony. We have a great church. Hallelujah. I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you so that God will continue to work in his Grace, continue to work in us, to change us and transform us. Because without God's Spirit, and you know, God's Spirit, He's not just moving around. He's moving in the hearts of the believers. 
And this is our job to be open. And it's like, Lord, I want to be, because I am the church, right? This is my brothers and sisters, and we here to be a great church. I want to experience the, your greatness through your grace and mercy, through your gift of the Spirit. I want to do what you did, and I want to continue to fellowship with believers because I know this is what I need for my soul. I will set the time. I will make the priorities in my life, and I believe that we'll all do, that. not only a few people, but if we all will be involved. I'm telling you. Some people who probably never yet attended the church, they will already feel there is something different in that church. Amen? Let's all stand. Let's all ask God, Lord, please come and make us a fellowship of believers where we all experience God's greatness and a lot of people will see that light and will come to you and worship them. Lord, thank you, Lord. You're awesome, Lord. You're the one who built the church, Lord Jesus. You're the one who is the head of the church, Lord. And that's why we're coming back to you, Lord. We want more of you, Lord Jesus. Help us to become real disciples, Lord Jesus Christ. We will wholeheartedly fall of you, Lord Jesus. In every day, Lord Jesus. In every situation, Lord Jesus Christ. And then we will gather together, Lord. Three or, or two or many, Lord Jesus. Help us remember, Lord Jesus, what makes us great. Not in the name of the church. Not the attendance of the church. Not even the cash flow, which is always the thing important. But Lord, your love, your grace, your mercy, Lord Jesus. Your spirit, Lord Jesus. Please come and feel us, Lord Jesus. Make these changes in our hearts. I'm praying and asking for this local church, Lord Jesus. Continue, Lord Jesus. Follow in your spirit, Lord Jesus. And let many others who have never been in that church yet, Lord Jesus, they will be drawn by you. And they will find a good church. And they will be introduced to you, Lord. I pray that and ask. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.